Well, that's a big subject, and uh, um, I guess uh, we'd have to talk about the big debates that took place when I was a student or a graduate student. That was a very hot topic. Well, still is to a certain extent. And uh, in those days, Quebec historians were very much doing socioeconomic history. And just to start with Fernand Ouellette, you know, who is kind of the first post-nationalist historian, um, he uh, argued that it was, the rebellions were a result largely of social economic changes. And he really focused on the economic uh, largely because he said that, well, let's start with the social. He argued that liberal professionals were being um, educated by the classical colleges and uh, moving and became quite overcrowded by, you know, after the turn of the 19th century because they weren't moving into business. And he argued because, you know, they're being trained by priests, they're being trained in the church for the church, but then they would tend to, if they didn't become priests, they became doctors, lawyers, or notaries. And many of them, because of the overcrowdedness of the profession, move into politics, move into journalism. Their standard of living, of course, is uh, a little lower than they expect. So they tend to, especially when they form a political party uh, and decide that uh, through the lower, the elected legislative assembly, they can gain power. More, po they they want more power for the elected body, and they will represent the people of Quebec, right, or of Lower Canada. Sorry. Um, and so it's in their own class self-interest, he argues, that French-Canadian nationalism starts. Um, and <clears throat> why do the habitants, the average person, listen to them? Uh, well, that argues it's because it was an agricultural crisis that t starts taking place as early as 1800, 1805. Um, French-Canadians have always grown wheat like they did in France. The soil is becoming exhausted. Uh, wheat crop uh, uh, yields is going down. The population is growing very fast, high birth rates. Well, everybody had high birth rates in those days, so the land is becoming overcrowded. And by the 1830s, you're having major crop failures. But he argues that that sense of grievance and nationalism, well, of, of, of preparedness to listen to scapegoats, if you want to call them, you know, the British governing system, that. So, well, that is a strong anti-nationalist, and he set up a, a really strong backlash on the part of the nationalist historians. This became a battle of numbers. How can you prove that uh, French Canadian crop you know, or you know their standard of living was going down? And I don't want to get into a whole lot of detail on that, but it was fascinating really because the other side would look at post-mortem inventories, uh, which you know in, in, the, in the French notarial system it's much more um, legalistic and uh, let's say bureaucratic than the English Canadian system. So when any when someone died, their estate was very carefully assessed. The value was put on it. Well, <clears throat> we're moving into the computer age, and we were able to uh, you know uh, analyze large sets of documents, and so hundreds, thousands of these postmortem inventories are examined. And they showed that uh, the material standard of living from 1800 to 1830s was not going down that significantly, right? So <clears throat> this is the sort of the, the, the nature of the debate for many, many years, which is kind of fizzled out now, as Willette and his generation have retired. Um, I would say a, a major turning point, although an outlier was Alan Greer's uh, book, which looks at it more, f the rebellions, more from the perspective of the uh, people, the habitants themselves, rather than the uh, nationalist elites, the, the, the liberal professionals and so on. And he argues that uh, th there was a genuine a radical um, impetus there uh, against uh, taxation by the church, compulsory tithes, against uh, seigneurial exploitation and so on, um, which the, the mainstream uh, patriot leaders were not behind necessarily. Louis-Joseph Papineau was a senior, so he wanted to continue the seigneurial system. Uh, he was an atheist, but he still wanted to keep the Catholic Church uh, as an official church, because as a nationalist, he felt these were important uh, features of the French-Canadian identity. 
Um, so Greer uh, looked at it more as a peasant rebellion, you know, uh, inspired by some of the French literature and so on, uh, which took us outside that nationalist, anti-nationalist debate that had been going on a long time. That doesn't mean to say that that debate has died or is over because there are still strong nationalists in Quebec who argue that this was an incipient uh, popular revolution and so on and, and what they call a normal you know, part of the revolutionary wave that was taking place in Europe for emancipation from colonial rule. So the arguments continue. It's still a very, uh, well, a lot of work being done on political ideology and so on even today. Uh, my own work, uh, that, that book that I wrote, which was partly on the rebellions, again looked at the townships. I, didn't, I don't think I was trying to contribute or resolve the debate so much because I was looking at English Canadians. But I think it was a, a useful contribution in the sense that I showed that it wasn't just French English, the way Lord Durham argued, you know, two nations warring in the bosom of a single state, a famous quote and the way the nationalist historians tend to depict it, that the Anglos are all kind of pro-British reactionaries, identify them with the you know, British, uh, the merchant class in Montreal and Quebec City, in the townships, uh, which was a significant population. There were more people living there than there were in Montreal at this time. Um, these people were, again, of American origin, and even though I've argued that the 1812 war and the missionaries uh, had a big impact in making them more uh, conservative, they still uh, voted up until towards the last few years before the rebellion uh, for the Patriot. And they still had some Patriot sympathizers. And even during the rebellions, there were some skirmishes uh, on the border. So I would argue that most of the people in the townships were uh, reformers, were uh, not if some of them are radicals, but certainly most of them were on the liberal side. They very much resented the British officials who were imposed on the region and who, uh, you know, uh, accumulated a lot of land and, and so on. No, no American or, you know, American descended person could get any patronage in the townships. So there was a lot of, and so there was a potential there for a, for a kind of a joining of uh, sides, which, which went on for a little while. But once the uh, Patriot movement became more radical and they started talking about independence and, re and revolution or rebellion, then the people in the townships would not go there because they would be a small minority in a, in a largely French-Canadian Catholic, you know. So it was easy to stir up their fears about what would happen if Papineau became, you know, king of Lower Canada or whatever. Um, and so in the end, um, they were willing to join militias. Well, actually, the militias weren't trusted at that time, so most of the fighting was done by British, uh, British officers. But I would say most people in townships were against the rebellion. That does not mean that they weren't part of a larger reform, move, reform movement or reform uh, impetus in the early 19th century. So I think that moves us away from thinking of the rebellions as a French-English thing exclusively and into one which is more about reform versus um, uh, stability or, or status quo.